أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول النبي الكريم أما بعد رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So today's topic is preparing the body and soul for the month of Ramadan Now these are two separate topics with regards to preparing the soul we have already covered up most of it in our previous sessions um, under the series of purification of the soul which in a gist focuses on emptying the heart for Allah and we've done a lot of topics on purification of the heart and how do we attain a sound heart so those of you who have missed it can refer to the recordings on the a softening hearts channel i think that's the name of the youtube channel so they have all of those recordings so you can actually listen to those again before the month of ramadan begins because we had done the same um series last time before the month of ramadan so <clears throat> what that includes is emptying the heart for allah trying to control the love of dunya from making us heedless purifying our soul so that we can enjoy our worship in the month of ramadan because if we think about it why is it that people don't have interest in reading the quran or why is it that people don't have interest in waking up for the night prayer or why is it that we become disinterested in doing anything like voluntary fasting or in general why do people become heedless from from putting their best when it comes to practicing the deen like wholeheartedly practicing why is it and the answer to that is in the quran itself because we're too busy with our dunya we are too busy with our worldly life Allah says in the Quran al hakum at takathur hatta zurtum al maqabir that the competition in this worldly increase it diverts you the mutual rivalry of piling up worldly gains it diverts you until you visit the graves so <clears throat> when we sense that we're drowning in the love of dunya because this phase will come and go in your life and that's the whole point of the test right that's the whole test where we try to focus on what our goal is and try to focus on the hereafter and keep cleaning our hearts for the sake of allah make space for it it's like the example of um, one of the scholars gives an example like imagine a cup which is already full of water or any drink right so if you try to pour something else in it it's not going to fill the cup i mean it's not going to enter the cup it's just going to pour out of the cup it might just hit the cup and come out or maybe a little bit of it will mix in and the rest will still fall out of the cup because the cup is already full so similarly if your heart is already fully distracted with worldly thoughts and worldly things and you're busy with things which are completely far away from the deen or from the remembrance of allah or from the hereafter then that becomes a distraction and there is no space for allah to enter there's no space for the love of allah to come and there's no space for uh even there's no space even for the knowledge to stay in that heart because it's just going to hit and go hit and go just like the example of what we gave last time about the sins how they create a covering upon the heart and then there's uh the reminders they don't even benefit that's how the hearts become hard so the first half of this session is just going to be a touch upon purification of the um the soul preparing the soul for ramadan but the second half is what i really want to focus on which is preparing the body physically for the month of ramadan because we kind of neglect um our physical of course the the in the soul aspect is the spiritual aspect is more important to be spiritually sound to have a sound heart uh to have a pure clean heart is of course way more important than the second half but the the connection of how the body helps in worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how when you're healthy when you take care of yourself physically how it aids you and makes it easier for you to be spiritually healthy so uh, the first part was regarding a uh, worldly life so how do we know that we are distracted because sometimes what happens is you're in this religious phase and then uh the dunya gets to you and you don't realize it and then you think that oh you know what i am practicing i have i'm doing everything i'm doing my basics but then what happens is we don't tend to dig deep into our ibadah in our daily rituals like for example salah we all may be praying five times a day but is there khushu in the salah we all may be fasting voluntarily also maybe on mondays and thursdays or on three white days but is there um is there that sense of feeling that you're doing this for the sake of allah or has it just become a ritual we all may be reading the quran reciting the quran in fact even learning the quran and um uh doing hijz or even reading it but are we uh benefiting from it are we tasting the sweetness of iman and that is why we keep brushing up again and again on the whole topic of tazkiyah because it's uh 
it's like it's like exercise of your soul just like how when you gym when you go to the gym or when you exercise physically to maintain that body similarly like if you stop gymming what happens your body gets out of shape again so similarly when you're when you just stop spiritually exercising your on your soul your soul also dies it kind of goes in the sleeping state and then you wonder after a long time that what happened there was a time when i was religious or i was practicing and all of a sudden everything changed so when so the one who senses that happening right in the beginning like just as soon as you start putting on weight you realize it and you control yourself and you get back on the treadmill or whatever similarly when you start sensing that the dunya is getting to you we immediately try to put ourselves back on track by remembering Allah by attending halaqas by reading about reminders by reading the Quran because the best medicine for the heart is the Quran right so we'll come we'll um, speak about all those hadith and quotes of the scholars inshallah so the first thing i want you to do is ask yourself what are you distracted with there's another verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, the time of their account is approaching the people while they are heedlessly turning away no mention comes to them anew from their Lord except that they listen to it while they are at play with their hearts distracted. So that's why I want you to think about what is it that distracts you and how will you um, think about it? Think about it this way. What is it that you think about before you sleep at night? Or what is it that you think about when you wake up in the morning or in the middle of the day? What is your current goal in life what is it that you're living for right now we all know the purpose of our life is to worship allah and to uh, focus on the hereafter and to get to jannah but in the middle of all of this you're on the path we kind of get distracted with other things and that's from shaitan he will keep bring he will try his best to distract you as much as he can till death till you die like, like how allah says that um the competition for this worldly life diverts you until you visit the graves so this battle with shaitan is going to go on till the end the the question is are you equipping yourself or are you struggling and striving to stay on the straight path to stay on the right track <clears throat> uh, the other thing is staying away from sins that is one of the other ways in which we can purify our soul and start preparing for Allah. Like if you're still sinning, if you still know that you're doing certain things which are displeasing to Allah, and if you don't get rid of them before the month of Ramadan, then you're going to miss out on a lot of uh, benefits or a lot of sweetness. You won't taste the sweetness of Iman if you're at the same time knowingly uh, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the dhikr of Allah, remembering Allah often, taqwa and all of that is what fasting brings about. And that's the whole purpose of fasting in the month of Ramadan. Like if we start before the month begins, we will have a completely different month rather than just jumping into the month and then starting off using those first few precious days or weeks in just preparing yourself and then missing out on those two weeks, right? Because every minute or every moment in the month of Ramadan is extremely precious for us to lose out on. Now... So now this was the first part which I don't want to spend too much time on because we've done that before. I'm going to focus more on the second part, which is preparing the body for the, um, because it's difficult for some people to just start all of a sudden. And that's why people get headaches and they're not prepared. And that is why there's wisdom in this, uh, in fasting in the month of Shaban. I think some microphone is on. I'm just going to mute the audio. Just a second. Okay. So uh, why is it important to prepare your body for this month or just in general? Why is it important to work physically also on your physical body? Now imagine that you're all set, you're in full mood, you, you want to worship, you want to stand long in salah, you decide that I'm going to read a lot of Quran, I'm going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all night long, I'm going to uh, do my best to have khushu in salah. But what happens is you can't stand long enough. And why? Because we overeat while opening our fast or just in general we overeat and so we end up becoming lazy we become sluggish you can't stand in salah you want to recite the quran in a loud beautiful voice you want to do the tilawa but you're tired or you want to stay up the whole night but you cannot because you didn't sleep well throughout the day or you didn't take your naps or you didn't have your you didn't prioritize your timing in order to worship allah successfully and that is why it's extremely important that we take care of our physical self also. And that is why we have so many hadith and narrations. Like if you look into it, if somebody really wants to live a healthy life, and if they just read the book, which is called The Medicine of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and inshallah, I was actually thinking while preparing for this, I was thinking of um, getting that book and actually doing 
that book for my own benefit and for all of you. So we can just do that book together, inshallah. Maybe one of the, I don't know which day, but inshallah someday. Just remind me if I forget, okay? So one of the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, uh, mentions is, let me just change the screen too, so that I had some screenshots to post today. Okay, so this is the next hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Take benefit of five before five. Your youth before your old age. You can look at the screen, those who are not looking at the screen. Your youth before your old age. Your health before your sickness. Your wealth before your poverty. Your free time before your preoccupation in your life before your death. So think about it. And many people uh, actually go through this. Like when you're healthy, we kind of take our health for granted. Until we fall sick or until something happens and you realize just how one headache can destroy your entire day or just how one toothache or just a small pinch or something or some kind of injury or a nerve pressing or your neck spraining, how you, it, like, it, it literally par uh, paralyzes, uh, it paralyzes you from functioning in your day-to-day -day life. And we realize it only when we lose it. So it's extremely important that we... One, be grateful to Allah for giving us that good health. And two, make use of it before it's too late. Like just like youth. Like if you're young and healthy and if you don't use up this time in ibadah, you're not going to have that same energy and that same vibe when you're old. Because it's more easy for a woman especially to fast during her youth or during her teenage before she actually becomes a mother because then all the breastfeeding comes in and then pregnancies and it becomes extremely difficult for you to even do the voluntary fasting and uh, some even women cannot even stand and pray any longer once they deliver or once they're in their pregnancies so that's why when you have the energy when you have the wealth spend it when you have your youth use it the worship of the youth is more beloved to allah when you have free time use it before you become busy and when you are free like if you if you realize that your exams are over or uh, whatever you're busy with and you get some free time, don't waste it in watching TV. Don't waste it in reading about things which are of no benefit to you. Use that free time in learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in learning about the deen because that is what will make you focus more. If you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have the reminders, it's very difficult for you to push yourself to do that. Then, um, okay, so even for you to contemplate well on Allah and his creation or just to focus or just to have khushu in yourself you have to be physically in a sound state of mind along with having a sound heart so if you slept well and if your body is healthy if, you, if you've eaten well if you're not neglecting these aspects then automatically it becomes easy for you to worship like think about the nights that you spend without sleep or you're eating junk food and oily food and heavy food and then next morning you have to wake up and just go about your day it's difficult right so how is it that you're going to focus in your salah or read quran especially in ramadan after maghrib like if we stuff ourselves and that, and that brings to my next hadith if we stuff ourselves with food how is it that we're going to stand for maghrib let alone taraweeh how are we going to stand for the night prayer and you're obviously going to feel sleepy you're obviously going to sleep and then again the sleep either you will sleep too much or then people don't sleep at all. It's, it's a complete mess if you don't prioritize this. So when before the month of Ramadan comes, try to set a fixed schedule for your ibadah, for your sleeping and for your eating. What you're going to eat, how you're going to eat, how much you're going to eat. And the best hadith that I can think of right now is, um, I think I have a picture for that too. So I'm going to post it on the screen. Before, the, before that one, oh, I can post actually multiple on my screen. Just a second. Okay. All right, the, the, before we miss this one, the Prophet ﷺ said, A Muslim eats in one intestine, he is which means he is satisfied with a little food, while the disbeliever eats in seven intestines, meaning eats much. And this is a hadith in Bukhari. And this is a hadith that I want you to focus on, the next one, which is on the screen right now. This picture that you see, it's divided into one third parts, right? And what is the hadith? The son of Adam cannot fill a vessel worse than his stomach, as it is enough for him to take a few bites to straighten his back. And if he cannot do that, then he may fill it with a third of his food, a third of his drink, and a third of his breath. So the next time you eat, this is what I want you to picture. This picture that you see on the screen, think about it. What, what, what happens is the orange part which you see there, the food part is the part that takes up most of it and then we don't, we don't have enough of our 
a drink or our water and we and there's absolutely no space for air right there's no space to even breathe and this especially in the month of ramadan where it should be controlled the most it's controlled the least and that is why our ibadah gets affected and then we end up sleeping oversleeping and missing out on the night of qadr and missing out on the huge rewards that come with it because if a person sleeps too much eats too much they it naturally it kind of makes you lazy it makes you sluggish and it actually makes you disinterested you're not interested in doing anything except just sitting and sleeping sufyan athawri said that if you want your body to be healthy and to sleep less then eat less eating too much also makes the heart hard and heedless of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then the next um it was said to imam ahmad that does a man find any softness and humility in his heart when he is full he said i do not think so and that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions used to go hungry quite frequently even in the presence of abundant abundant food which means that even if the table is full of stuff that control which a person has like once you have that control on your eating you naturally acquire control over many other things because hunger is something that comes naturally and it's a natural tendency to just jump in and start eating right but when you control that and when you like just like in ramadan how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made fasting uh if you see the wisdom behind fasting ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun that oh you who believe fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed on those before you so that you may attain taqwa right so that you may become god conscious so even though we know that um even though we like even though it's halal we eat throughout the year but then that's the month where we stop right so when we can have control over something which is halal it's easier for your soul it's like a training for your soul to have control over that which becomes haram outside the month right or even inside like in general you kind of gain this will power to control yourself and that is why i just want to on the side no i want to focus on this worship of fasting because uh i also have a few slides on the virtues of fasting i'll just quickly read the main hadith from there and then we'll come back to this topic mm, i hope i've saved it just a second okay so the word siyam in arabic it actually means abstaining uh i'm not going to go through everything okay before we begin that some of the scholars say that fasting is one of the oh i did not see the chat session okay so one of the um uh, lectures that i was listening to in that they say that after salah the second most important worship is siyam which is fasting because it is something and we know right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh all of the these of the son of adam are for himself except for fasting which is for me and i will reward him for it which means that the reward of fasting is not even mentioned by allah which means it is so high so high that we don't we cannot even imagine what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in store for those who fast sincerely for his sake and think about it this way all the other acts of worship are physically seen by people whereas fasting unless you mention it nobody will really know that you're doing it and of course in ramadan everybody assumes that a muslim is fasting but think about it outside the month of ramadan or even in ramadan when you go in front of non muslims nobody is going to look at you and know that you are actually in a state of ibadah for example if you're praying salah there are physical movements and people can see that yes she's praying if you're wearing hijab it's an act of ibadah you everybody can see that okay she's a practicing muslim you go for hajj it's a physical act you're giving money it's a physical act. so it's all of these are seen acts of ibadah and there can be an element of riya in all of these right there can be an element of showing off in all of the other acts of worship whereas when it comes to fasting there is very 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 little chance of any show off in this act so somebody who's actually not sincere with allah and is just doing it to show people he can just go eat quietly and sneak and tell everybody that oh i'm fasting but in reality he's cheating right because he's cheating with allah and allah knows that so this is the only act which is exclusively seen by allah which is exclusively known to allah nobody else knows who is fasting and who is not fasting because when you're outside fasting nobody can say that oh you're unless you mention that you know what i'm fasting So that's why this this is an act which really like you can just imagine the level of taqwa of a person 
who is especially uh, you won't realize this maybe in ramadan but outside ramadan when it's a monday or a thursday and everybody in your house is eating drinking or in your at your workplace or wherever you are it's everybody is busy doing their thing when it's lunchtime everybody's eating but you have this a kind of private feeling or this thing that this is for the sake of Allah I have given this up for the sake of Allah right it it really builds it it takes your it takes your it takes your taqwa to a completely different level and that is why the purpose of fasting which Allah mentions in the Quran is increasing the taqwa and especially in the month of Shaban this is what and now we hardly have like four or five days left for the month of Shaban and then one month left for Ramadan so this is the time where we should actually put in your best to do it and why wouldn't you do it like why would you not want to do it now if i actually mention to you the physical or the medical benefits of fasting which actually studies are being done upon like right now there are so many published articles and so many um theories and so many researches done just on how intermittent fasting is healthy for you how it can protect you from cancer how it can protect you from heart diseases and diabetes and all of the diseases that come in they are literally it's not the muslims it's the non muslims who are researching on these topics and actually proving the benefits of fasting twice a week and they literally mentioned twice a week i wish i had that i could have posted it but i didn't get time to look into that but i've read it a long time ago where they've actually done research and it shows that intermittent fasting throughout the week meaning twice a week it actually helps you uh protects you from a lot of diseases and if you see if you actually study upon the whole origin of diseases and problems in the body it all originates in the gut if you study deeply into medicine and if you dig deep into it all of the diseases all originate in the gut and that is why there is also another hadith which i don't have right now but there's somewhere where the prophet sala i'm just um it's not verbatim i'm just paraphrasing it where the prophet sala says that the oh yeah we just mentioned it the son of adam cannot fill a vessel worse than his stomach and another hadith which says about uh how all the diseases begin in the stomach in the gut stomach doesn't mean like the stomach in as in the stomach in and of itself but basically the intestines and all of that that comes in the abdominal region so that is where all diseases begin and that's why this topic is extremely important not just from the spiritual aspect but just in general from the just your for your worldly life just to keep yourselves healthy whatever you eat is what's going to affect you you are what you eat it's not you are what you eat because what you're eating right now the effect of that you're going to see it like either in some days or in the future if you think that if you're eating junk and if you're not if you don't have any knowledge about the foods that you're putting in your body if you don't study about this you might not see the consequences of it right now but you will definitely see the consequences slowly as they uh, come in future when you're when you cross your 35 40 or maybe even 30 and 50s that's when you will see the effects of all the junk that you ate throughout your life or all the until like diabetes hits you and then you realize you can't have sugar until high cholesterol hits you and you realize that you cannot eat all the stuff that you used to eat before until you literally get diagnosed with something and then you realize that oh you know what i can't do that anymore and don't think that you're immune from it like you you might not have it right now but when you reach a certain stage and when you actually go for your checkup or for your routine examination you might end up having those uh, issues so we have to take that precaution and i i don't remember but i think there was one of the scholars who actually said that um food is actually medicine if you actually study upon it and that's why i want to do that book medicine of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you study upon this topic in detail you will realize that you you won't have to be on medications if you eat healthy and if you know what you're eating and that's why this whole topic that i wanted to discuss today is regarding this issue uh before i forget let me just check if i've missed out on anything Umar radiyallahu an who said that by Allah if i wanted i could wear the finest clothes among you and eat the best food and have the most luxurious life but i heard that Allah will condemn people for some of their actions and said you received your good things in the life of the world and you took your pleasure therein now this day you shall be recompensed with the torment of humiliation and then the verse goes on it's one of the verses in the quran which umar radiyallahu anhu referred to when he said that if you had everything in the dunya then what have you left for your akhirah if you are just going to live to eat right and not eat to live you're, you're like if you're just your whole life is just about eating and just following your desires and just giving in to any junk that comes your way then what have you left for yourself and if 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 we speak about the worldly benefits of it then people will kind of wake up and try to work on it but when we when the when the prophet tells him says fast we kind of say oh it's just a sunnah so i'm not going to do it 
But when the medical people come and say that, oh, you know, if you fast twice a week, it's going to help your body, it's going to protect you from diseases, and that's when then we think about it. It, it should be because Allah said so, and the Prophet said so, and we do it. And similarly, when all the foods that are mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we look into those foods, and now when we see what the, the researchers say, or what the medical side of it says, you, we realize that we knew these things thousands of years ago, like 1400 years ago, while these people are discovering it maybe now, or they just discovered it a few um, years back. And I'm going to speak about those specific things in the next few minutes, inshallah. Uh, I'm just reading this article. It was an article that I read on one of the websites of Dr. Farad Hashmi. So I'm just reading that part. A Muslim considers his food and drink means to something else. They are not a goal and pleasure in themselves. He eats and drinks in order to keep his body healthy so that he may worship Allah in his best form. This is the worship that will make him qualified for the honor of the life and happiness of the hereafter. He does not eat and drink for the sake of eating and drinking itself or its desires. Therefore, if he is not hungry, he does not eat. If he is not thirsty, he does not drink. Um, the, I don't have the uh, quotation. I don't have the dalil for the next hadith which is coming. But I got on the website of Dr. Farad Hashmi. So I'm assuming it's authentic. We are a people who do not eat until we are hungry. And if we eat, we do not eat to our full. So what it means is that eat only when you're hungry. Not that, okay, just because uh, the food is there in front of me. So I just pick it up and stuff it into myself. Next time when you, when you see... Um, junk around one of the ways in which you can actually control yourself is by thinking about you see some junk being thrown into the garbage into, into the garbage can right like sometimes we have these leftover make take for example like the worst food you can think of like donuts or any sugary stuff that is there or coke or cans coke and soda and stuff like that and imagine somebody looks at it with disgust and throws it in the garbage like the entire can of coke you just throw it in the garbage right and now imagine the person sitting right next to it. So one person is disgusted with it and considers it to be literally drinking sugar and throws it in the garbage can. And at the same time, there's another person sitting right next to that person sitting and putting that same stuff in his belly. So literally, you're treating your, your abdomen like a garbage can putting in all this junk. So think about this next time when you actually want to control yourself from eating the food that you're not supposed to be eating. Uh, next is... Again, I'm just reading this sentence from the article. The weight loss industry is a multi-billion dollar business. Obesity is a major American tragedy affecting millions of people of all ages. Overeating is leading people to a variety of illnesses from heart disease to diabetes, arthritis, asthma, from nightmares and insomnia to depression and anxiety, just to name a few. Again, when it comes to food, also the, your mood is also affected by what you eat. Like, you know, when, when it comes to kids, when we say like you know don't give them too much sugar they'll get hyper don't give them certain things that will make them irritate and so that also applies to us so when it comes to what you're eating it also affects your mood and also your state of mind because it's it's a, some foods like they completely take your hormonal balance off track some foods bring it on track so we if you if we don't have this knowledge how are we you know how do we expect to live a healthy life and if you feel that okay it's not important let me just carry on with life then fine then you're just going to carry on with um, that load when you can easily just offload and live a happy healthy life right the next point is about eating tayyib, eating pure and clean foods and not processed foods because again this affects your ibadah if you are not eating healthy again all those previous effects that I mentioned about being lazy sluggish not feeling like getting up being depressed being sad not in the mood to do ibadah all of things all of those things come in because we're eating the wrong things um let me see what's next. Okay. So the next point is about going out of your way to look into what foods are healthy. Because see, just like how I said in the previous sessions that just like how salah is something we do five times a day, right? And so we should study it in detail, the fiqh of salah and how do we pray and what do we, like what invalidates my salah and how do we do it perfectly because we're doing it every single day, five times a day. We're living with it. So that's why we study it in detail. Similarly, and I think that session is going to time out. So let me just, everybody just log in again before the session times out. Okay, so just like how we um, 
the things that we do on a daily basis should be studied more in detail by us. Like, for example, when we pray, how do we pray? When we do certain things on a daily basis, it's more important for us to look into them in detail. So just like that, the food that we eat, literally we eat every single day of our life. So it is extremely important that we look into what we're eating. For example, just take the basic example of milk. Right? Milk is something that is found in every household. We, our children grow on it. We uh, have it like almost, some people have it almost on a daily basis. But do you know what is in that milk? And do you, do you really know? Uh, I really want you to answer this question right now on the screen. Like, do you know what is in that milk? Like, is it fresh and pure or is it processed? Because the milk that we have today in the stores is not the milk that the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned a number of hadith upon, uh, you know, the hadith which speaks about milk as being a cure. There is, um, I, I'm going to I'm going to read those hadith right now, but the reference that the Prophet ﷺ had for milk is not the milk that you buy in stores today. Because the milk that you buy in stores today is processed, it's pasteurized, it's heated to a certain temperature in order to kill the, uh, the contamination or the bacteria that are formed in it. And then it's brought down to a cooling temperature and then it's put into bottles or into cartons. And then you see the expiration of those cartons is sometimes up to six months, sometimes four months. And if it's least pasteurized, you can still have it for up to three weeks or less or more. Okay, so this is something that I want to focus on because this is, I'm just going to deal with basic foods like milk, honey, dates and black seed. Just a few because uh, when we do the book Medicine of the Prophet, we will do the whole book inshallah. But just... Um, these few basic foods which are there in every home, are is it pure that you're drinking and eating? That's what the question is. So those of you who don't know, the hadith about uh, the Prophet ﷺ where he said that treat yourselves with the milk of cows. I hope that Allah will make it a cure for every disease because cows eat from all sorts of plants. Another hadith with um, the Prophet ﷺ said, and these are all authentic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created a sickness except that he has created a cure for it except for old age. So drink the milk of cows because they eat from all sorts of plants. Another hadith, raise cows because their milk is a cure from diseases and their butter is medication. Their meat, however, is a cause of illness. So all of this, and of course we know the verses in the Quran which speak about rivers of milk, honey, um, then another verse which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that and verily in cattle you will find an instructive sign from what is within their bodies between excretion and blood we produce for you drink milk which is pure and agreeable to those who drink so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling milk pure uh, there's a question how about organic milk okay so if we if we break it up into detail do you guys want me to do the detail of this and then we can move on so uh, okay yes so when it comes to milk you have different types of milk one is just the the most cheap and the most adulterated milk is the one which has, uh, or, which is a non-organic milk, which is where you have the hormones and the anti, uh, the antibiotics and stuff like that. So that milk is a complete, complete no. It, it's literally like a poison for your body. You rather not have milk than to have that kind of milk. The milk which is comp which is inorganic, which is completely pasteurized and uh, which is which does not mention that there is no uh, hormones or antibiotics used on those cows. For those of you who don't understand, what happens in the, milk, in, the, in the milking industry is the cows which they have, they inject them with hormones so that they produce more amount of milk. But then that is also coming into your milk. Just like how when the mother breastfeeds, whatever she eats affects the child. So whatever the cow is eating or grazing upon or being injected with affects the milk that it produces. So if uh, the cow is sick and they put in antibiotics, they're coming into the milk. If, they, if they're putting injecting hormones, they're coming into the milk. Also, what they eat is important because if the cow is not treated well and if the cow is eating uh, uh, grain instead of grass, then again, the quality of the milk is going to be affected. Now, what organic means is that they are not injected with antibiotics and they are not injected with hormones. Okay, this is what organic means, meaning they're free from these two things. But that does not mean that the milk is still pure. What it means is the milk is just not having the hormones and the antibiotics it is still better than the other milk but still again the organic milk which is pasteurized and this is what i want you to focus on the word pasteurized the word pasteurized is the thing that makes the milk dead for example imagine you take breast milk you heat it on the stove you're killing the antibodies you're killing the immune power of that milk 
That's the whole point. You're killing the enzymes, the amino acids that the milk naturally possesses because of the heat. So the answer to this is to have raw milk. That is the milk that is pure milk, not the milk that you get in the cartons and in the stores. And raw milk is, unfortunately, it's not very easily available, especially in the West. Literally in every Western country, raw milk is illegal to be sold in bulk. But you can get it from local farms. So if you're in the West and if you, ha if you know of local farmers or a local farm, they usually give in some states, it's Ill it's, I think it's illegal in 17 or 20 states in the US. I don't know about Canada. And I, I think it's illegal even in Australia. But um, in US, there are certain states where you can, it's legal for you to go to local farms and pick it up from the farm. Okay, now, if you go online and Google raw milk, you're going to be reading about stuff like, oh, but you can die with raw milk, you can get sick with raw milk, you will have um, uh, salmonellosis and uh, E. coli infection and stuff like that, which is true. If you're going to go to a regular store and just pick up uh, from in a conventional milk factory and pick up milk and just drink it, you can fall sick. But if you go to a farm which is which claims to have grass-fed cows, no hormones and antibiotics, well-fed cows, and they're taken care of and they're clean, and you uh, get the milk from them, then that is the milk that the Prophet Sassam referred to, the pure, clean milk, not the milk which is in the stores today. And again, I don't know, um, I don't know which place you guys come from, but um, in India, I think, again, there's a lot of adulteration that happens in milk and it's difficult to get like completely clean and pure milk unless you yourself go and know the farmer or the place and you get your pure milk. The best thing for you to do is actually go yourself, look if, if milk is an important part of your diet, that is, to go and look for the best and the clean and get it for yourself. Because uh, you know what, we can do this this in the Q&A session because I don't want to put the whole topic on milk. So we'll discuss this inshallah towards the end because I have a lot of details about this topic. So whoever's interested, we can, here we have buffalo milk. Yeah, that's also fine as long as it's pure and raw. The, the key word here is raw and not pasteurized. What happens is pasteurization, it increases the shelf life of the milk. So it can be sold in the stores for a longer time, but it's at the cost of your health, right? Now, some of the re research does say that it does not destroy everything in the milk. And some of them say that it destroys literally everything in the milk and you're just drinking dead milk, just like a dead white beverage that you're drinking. So... Even if you give benefit of doubt and say that, okay, not everything is not destroyed, there, the fact is that the key enzymes and the key, the immune power of the milk is destroyed with heat to a certain extent. And that is how you lose out on this beneficial curing properties that the Prophet Sallallahu said. And if you actually Google it or if you go on YouTube and watch benefits of raw milk, you will see white leading uh, scientists and microbiologists and doctors doing research and literally saying that 95% of diseases can be cured just by drinking raw milk. So go research it, look into it. There are pros and cons of both, but um, if you look into it, the benefits outweigh the, the risk of it. And like if you see, like literally, like if now, when, I, when actually I watched the documentary on it, I realized that these people are actually, the, it's like the white doctors which people look up to and think that they're the most ahead in research and stuff like that. They are saying that literally they've got, they've got AIDS, they've cured cancer, they've got, cured different types of allergies and stuff like that with just milk, just on a milk diet. And this the Prophet told us 1400 years ago, and I, the hadith is in front of you. I wish I could actually post it. I don't have it right now, but I can post it. Uh, where there are three specific hadith, specifically on cow's milk, where the Prophet said that treat yourselves with cow's milk. For every disease, Allah has created a cure. And so upon you is the milk of cows. So all of these narrations the Prophet already mentioned to us before, which these people are discovering now, and this whole craze of raw milk, which we will discuss, inshallah, in detail. The next, um, the next is... Honey again, there comes forth from their bellies a drink varying in color wherein there is healing for men. Verily, in this indeed is a sign for the people who think. <clears throat> uh, there are two cures for you, honey and the Quran. So basically, honey, the cure for the body and Quran, the cure for the soul. Uh, now regarding honey again, not the honey that you get in stores, not the processed honey. It has to be raw, unfiltered honey. So when you buy honey next time, you have to go and look into it that it's raw and it's unfiltered, which means that it should not be processed to make it smooth and make the shelf life longer and last over there. It has to be the fresh, pure honey. 
And again, it comes to everything. It comes to nuts. We can actually have a whole medical topic on this issue. If you want it, inshallah, we can have a session on that. But this is not the topic for today. We're just doing it in general. The next are dates. Again, we know the benefits of dates. And I think I have a, a poster for that right now. So let me just post it on the screen. And that is why... Oh, I don't have it on the screen right now. I had it like sometime. Oh, here it is. I got it. The Prophet ﷺ said that those who eat some ajwa dates every morning will not be affected by poison or magic on that day until night. So again, we see that even during suhoor, when we wake up, even if you're, if you're late and if you really can't have a full-fledged meal, if you just drink milk and if you just have dates, and I'm talking about the clean, pure milk, the milk and the dates, that's enough for you to survive the whole day without feeling any hunger or any weakness. And that is why we, if we look at, again into the benefits of dates and the, the nutritional value of dates, again, there is wisdom behind why we open our fast on dates and why we break our fast, I mean, why we start our fast with dates. And that's the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. The next, again, black seed. It was narrated from Abu Huraira that the Prophet ﷺ said that in black seed there is a healing for every disease except death. Um, and lastly, the last hadith, some of the companions of the Messenger ﷺ said, we eat but we are not satisfied. Which means that sometimes when you eat a lot, you still feel hungry. So the Prophet ﷺ replied by saying, perhaps you eat separately. And then the companions replied, in, yes, we do. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that eat together and mention the name of Allah over your food. It will be blessed for you. So again, before we eat, we have to say Bismillah. If you really want nutrition from that food and if you want to be benefited completely from that food, remember to say Bismillah before we eat and drink so that Allah puts barakah in even whatever little you eat. So even if you eat little, that is enough for you to survive. Always remember the hadith about the few morsels of food are enough to keep the back of the son of Adam straight. Because if you remember this hadith, you, uh, as soon as you finish three or four pieces, you know that this is enough for you, right? And you won't indulge in more. So I'm going to end this session here and then we will do the Q&A and the discussion so I can finish the recording and uh, keep the second part as a separate recording so we can just post it on the group, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha 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 il